Welcome to Tales from the Periodic Table. I'm your host, Ron Hipschman, and today we're going to talk about the element iridium. Unfortunately, because of its rarity and cost, I don't have a sample to show you like I always try to do. Here we see the beautiful periodic table produced by Theodore Gray. As I've mentioned in previous episodes, Teo has written one of my favorite books called The Elements, which I encourage you to pick up. Check out his fantastic website, periodictable.com. Iridium is the 77th element in the periodic table. Its atomic number is 77 because that's how many protons are in its nucleus, and that is what distinguishes it as a unique element. In 1803, Smithson Tennant made a solution of aqua regia, a mixture of concentrated hydrochloric and nitric acid. He noticed when he dissolved crude platinum in the aqua regia, it would slowly dissolve away like you see here. However, a black powder residue remained behind. Earlier chemists who performed this experiment assumed the remnants were forms of carbon, probably graphite. Tennant continued to work with the residue and eventually found it contained two metals, which he called iridium and osmium, the previous element in this series. He gave the element the name iridium after the Greek goddess Iris, personification of the rainbow because of the striking and diverse colors of its salts. Iridium is a member of the platinum group of metals in the middle of the periodic table. The six members of the group are ruthenium, rhodium, palladium, osmium, iridium, and obviously platinum. They all have similar chemical and physical properties and usually occur together in the same mineral deposits. Spirulite is one of the minerals where iridium is found. It forms these beautiful silvery crystals. It's mostly a platinum arsenide, but since the platinum group of elements are usually found together, there's usually a bit of iridium arsenide in there too. One of the places you find platinum ores, which include iridium, is in Ontario, Canada, near the town of Sudbury. Here you can find the Big Nickel Mine, which produces a rich variety of metals. When I was last there, they gave a fascinating tour of the mine. Near the mine, on a beautiful lake, is a gem of a museum called Science North, with a unique snowflake-inspired architecture. I encourage you to visit this innovative and interactive science center if you're in the area. Iridium is also part of a large group in the middle of the periodic table called the transition metals. This section of the periodic table is where we fill the d electron orbital of the respective atoms as we move from left to right across the periodic table. The world produces only about 6,800 kilograms, yes, kilograms, of iridium annually. The vast majority of the world's iridium, about 90%, is mined in South Africa. Zimbabwe and Russia make up just about the rest of the remaining 10%. The big nickel mine only produces iridium as a byproduct. Not surprisingly, South Africa also produces the majority of the world's supply of the other platinum group metals, since they're usually found together. South Africa's Bushveld Igneous Complex, just to the north of Pretoria and Johannesburg, is the major source of platinum group metals. Platinum, the red stars, is found on the borders of the geological zones. As I mentioned, iridium is really a byproduct of mining for platinum, nickel, and copper. Iridium is pretty pricey stuff. Depending on purity and the quantity you buy, it'll currently, in 2024, run you about $5,000 per troy ounce, or about $161,000 per kilogram. 
Iridium would have been a good investment if you had bought it before 2020. It's almost tripled in value since then. Note, I'm not giving any advice about buying metals as an investment. Iridium is a very beautiful silvery metal. This is a very pure arc-melted pellet. You can buy these online, but be prepared to pay a pretty penny for them. I found this one with a quick Google search, and this BB-sized half-gram pellet was $424. A similar-sized osmium pellet was only $80 from the same source. The element iridium is one of the rarer we've dealt with so far. Coming in as the 51st most abundant element in the universe by mass, only two parts per billion. Equally abundant in the sun, it also makes up only two parts per billion of its mass and is the 50th most abundant element there. It's the 46th most abundant element in meteorites at 5.4 parts per 10 million. Very uncommon in the crust of the Earth, it's the 83rd most common element at 4 parts per 10 billion. Gold is almost 10 times as abundant at 3.1 parts per billion. Iridium is undetectable in the oceans of the Earth. And lastly, like most of the elements in the upper reaches of the periodic table, there's no iridium in us. This complicated version of the periodic table shows the evolution of the elements through the history of the universe. Here, you see each element square with a tiny chart of its own showing that element's growth over the age of the universe by various processes. Iridium is here. I understand this looks complicated, but let's look at just Iridium a little closer. The horizontal axis of this square represents time, from the Big Bang to now. The vertical axis shows the proportion of iridium created by various processes. Less than one-sixth of the iridium present today is believed to be produced by dying low-mass stars, the magenta area. Most of the rest is produced in supernovae, the yellow area. A very, very small portion, almost invisible, that green icing on the top is produced in neutron star mergers. Each element has many different forms. For each specific element, the number of protons in the nucleus is the same, 77 protons for iridium, but there can be different numbers of neutrons in the nucleus. All these different forms, called isotopes, are chemically identical to each other but with slightly different weights. The number you see next to the chemical symbol is the total number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. There are 36 isotopes of iridium. And of these, there are only two stable non-radioactive isotopes. These two stable isotopes are found in different proportions in nature. 37.3% of iridium-191 and 62.7% of iridium-193, adding up to a tidy 100%. By the way, the word isotope comes from the Greek isos, meaning same or equal, and topos, meaning place, since all these various forms of iridium occupy the same place in the periodic table. Of the radioactive isotopes of iridium, these are the longest lived, the ones with half-lives over one hour. Well, I left iridium-183 since it was so close to one hour. More on half-life in the next slide. The longest iridium half-life is iridium-192, with a half-life of almost 74 days. We'll see iridium-192 again a bit later in the applications section. Note that I've left out radioactive isomers, elements with excited states of their nuclei, because that would double the size of this list. The important thing to note is there are no really long-lived isotopes. Even the longest-lived isomer, iridium-192m2, has a 241-year half-life. 
That's why we don't see radioactive iridium in nature. In the 13.8 billion years the universe has been around, all the radioactive iridium has decayed away. What's a half-life? This graph shows an exponential decreasing curve. As an example, let's say we start with 1,024 atoms of any isotope from the previous slide. I chose 1,024 atoms because it's a power of 2, and we'll be doing a lot of dividing by 2. If you wait one half-life, half of your isotope will decay, and you'll have 512 atoms left. If you wait one more half-life, half of that half decays, leaving you with one quarter of the original 1,024, or 256 atoms. Another half-life, half again as many, or 128 atoms, and so on. Just keep dividing by two every half-life. After 10 half-lives, you'll have about one one-thousandth of your original amount. By the way, Notice there's one remaining atom after 10 half-lives. If you waited one more half-life, your remaining atom would have a 50-50 chance of decaying in that time. Iridium has the second highest density of all the elements at 22.56 grams per cubic centimeter, barely less than the density of osmium, a mere three hundredths of a gram per cubic centimeter higher. As a reminder, water has a density of 1 gram per cubic centimeter. I've put up more densities for you here. You can see that osmium is very, very close in density to our element today, only one-tenth of one percent different. Here's a graph of the elements from highest density to lowest density. I have a set of blocks so you can feel density for yourself in my live talks. My set of blocks have a wide range of densities, with the densest at tungsten, to lead, to copper, to iron, to titanium, to aluminum, to magnesium. I also have wood and plastic blocks, but those are not technically elements. Again, Iridium's density is 22.56 grams per cubic centimeter, the magenta circle. Its density is just slightly less than osmium, even if this chart shows iridium on top. I'd love to have a cube of this stuff, but at its current cost, that cube would be almost $678,000. Any iridium refiners out there? I'm open to the donation of a two and a quarter inch cube if you're so inclined to add to my collection. It would be a very nice thing to have a cube that weighed 4.21 kilograms or nine and a quarter pounds. Being one of the refractory metals I'll discuss in a bit, iridium has the high melting point of 2,466 degrees Celsius, or 4,471 degrees Fahrenheit. It has the eighth highest melting point of the elements. Iridium boils at a blistering 4,428 degrees Celsius, or 8,002 degrees Fahrenheit, giving it the ninth highest boiling point of all the elements. That's 1,962 degrees Celsius above its melting point. Iridium has the 22nd largest liquid temperature range of all the elements, almost exactly the same as our previous element in this series, osmium. These are the official refractory metals. These metals are extraordinarily resistant to heat and wear. They all share some properties, including a melting point above 2,000 degrees Celsius and high hardness at room temperature. They're relatively chemically inert and have high densities. Iridium is not quite in this group, but some of the other transition metals surrounding the central group share some of the same qualities, some to a somewhat lesser extent. Note that Technetium is not included in this group since it must be made artificially and is highly radioactive. But iridium is definitely part of this group. If we compare the size of the iridium atom to that of hydrogen, we'd see something like this. The iridium atom is about 3.4 times the size of hydrogen. Here's the electron structure. By the way, a 
Picometer is a trillionth of a meter. Atoms are impressively small. Looking at all the element atom sizes, here we see them sorted from largest, cesium, on the top left, to smallest, helium, on the bottom right. Iridium has the 32nd largest sized atom of the elements. Iridium is pretty hard stuff, coming in at 6.5 on Mohs scale of hardness. This is a chart of the element hardness from hardest, boron, on the left, to the softest, cesium, on the right, obviously not including liquids or gases. Iridium is the seventh hardest element between vanadium and tantalum. Iridium has the 14th lowest rate of thermal expansion of all the elements, only 6.4 parts per million per Celsius degree. This means if you had a one meter long bar of iridium and you heated it by one degree Celsius, it would get longer by only 6.4 millionths of a meter, or about one-tenth the diameter of a human hair, a pretty low expansion rate. Here's the periodic table of the spectra. Iridium has a moderately complex set of emission lines across the spectrum. If I increase the contrast to remove the background spectrum, you can see this more plainly. These emission colors uniquely identify it as iridium to scientists. No other element gives off this set of colors. Let's take a look at a few applications of iridium. First, cool as they are, I'd like to quickly note that iridium satellite phones have nothing to do with the element iridium, so we can put that out of our minds. I don't even know why the company used the name other than some gimmicky marketing ploy. Iridium phones are often called satellite phones since they use a flock of 66 iridium satellites, also no iridium involved there, to bounce and amplify signals making worldwide wireless communication anywhere possible, for a price. Iridium is the most corrosion-resistant metal of all the elements. This makes it useful for many things. For instance, spark plugs. Iridium is six times harder and eight times stronger than platinum, another precious metal used in high-grade spark plugs. Copper spark plugs have an expected lifetime of 20,000 miles. Spark plugs with platinum-tipped electrodes can last as long as 100,000 miles, and iridium spark plugs can last up to 25% longer than that. Iridium-tipped spark plugs are more expensive, at a price point of $8 to $15 per plug. I suppose that must mean that the pictured Bosch double iridium plug must be twice as expensive as normal iridium spark plugs. The tips of fountain pens can have a small blob of iridium added to them. This adds to the wear resistance of the tip and the bragging rights of the pen. Iridium becomes part of our story for its discovery in a layer of clay found in sedimentary rocks. Here we see the late physicist Louis Alvarez and his geologist son Walter Alvarez at a layer of rock he discovered that puzzled him. This thin layer seemed to coincide with a date around the time of the extinction of the dinosaurs. Walter was inspired to find out all he could about this thin layer of clay. Luckily, his father, Louis, was at the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory, and he had access to some brilliant resources, including chemist Frank Asaro and Helen von Michael. Here's a closer look at the same layer of clay at a different location. Here are Helen von Michael, Frank Asaro, Walter Alvarez, and Louis Alvarez in 1969. Helen and Frank assisted in the identification of excessive iridium in the clay layer, separating the Cretaceous rocks from the Paleogene rocks. Iridium is normally very rare in the crust of the Earth, as we've discussed, yet 
Here was a layer of rock with way too much of the element. Helen, the only female chemist at the lab, had developed very accurate protocols for identification and dating using a method called neutron activation analysis. In addition to the excessive iridium, the layer of clay was dated to around 66 million years ago, around the time of the extinction of the dinosaurs and three quarters of life on Earth. This led the Alvarezes to a wild hypothesis that the Earth had been struck by a large, metal-rich asteroid causing these extinctions. Metal-rich asteroids contain a higher level of iridium than the crust of the Earth. In addition, other features of the clay also indicated an impact origin, and this clay can be found worldwide. The hypothesis caused a sensation and much argument in the scientific community on both sides. The arguments were pretty much settled in the early 1990s when an impact crater 93 miles in diameter was discovered on the northern coast of the Yucatan Peninsula. This was called the Chicxulub impact. This was one of the largest asteroid collisions we know of. Unfortunately, Weathering has completely removed surface features, so we don't see any visual evidence of the crater today. By taking very delicate gravitational measurements, instruments have revealed the hidden crater as seen in this overlay. This was the collision that laid down the worldwide layer of clay sediment rich in iridium. We believe the Chicxulub impact was caused by an asteroid with a diameter of 7 to 50 miles, which struck the Earth at a speed of 12 miles per second, almost 45,000 miles per hour. For more info, I refer you to Epic's Pictures video, The Last Minute of the Dinosaurs, on YouTube. It's worth a watch. Another place corrosion resistance was important was in creating international standards. In 1889, the kilogram was defined as the mass of a cylinder made from an alloy of 90% platinum and 10% iridium that was stored in a vault in Paris. All other kilograms were compared to this standard. Iridium was added to the original pure platinum kilogram standard to improve the hardness and increase the density while retaining the extreme chemical inertness. This was the world's standard for the kilogram until 2019. The kilogram is now based on fundamental physical constants reproducible in any lab. The kilogram is no longer based on a physical artifact. Likewise, the meter was based on the distance between two marks on a platinum iridium bar, similar to the one you see here. The meter is now based on the distance light travels in 1 ths of a second, and the second is based on 9,192,631,770 vibrations of a specific microwave given off by cesium-133 atoms. So again, no physical artifact is used for the meter. Still, iridium was once involved. The radioactive isotope iridium-192 is a gamma emitter, with a half-life of 73.8 days. It's used in treating cancer with a method called brachytherapy. Brachytherapy involves inserting a small pellet containing the radioactive isotope next to or even inside the tumor for a short period of time, killing the cancer cells while hopefully affecting nearby normal cells a bit less. It's useful for cervical, prostate, and head and neck tumors. Aside from a microscopic bit, possibly absorbed from the environment, your body does not contain or use iridium, and it has no known biological functions. As usual, we'll end this talk with Mary Soon Lee's elemental haiku about iridium.
The dinosaurs gone. Your fingerprint in the clay. Incriminating. In the next program in this series, I'll examine another precious and chemically resistant element, platinum. I hope you'll join me. I'm your host, Ron Hipschman. Thank you for watching this Tales from the Periodic Table program about the element iridium.